Hi guys. Uh, my name is Jillian and I am going to be talking to you about fortitude today. So for starters, I just want to take a minute to introduce myself. So like I said, my name is Jillian. I am married to an amazing husband. His name is Russell and at the end of this month, it'll be 10 years. We have one amazingly sweet daughter. Her name is Ella. Two cats, Pixie and Oliver, and one very large dog, Samson. He weighs 180 pounds. Um, anyway, as mentioned, I want to talk to you today about fortitude. So I would like to talk to you um, about a man named Maximilian Colby. Uh, some of you are probably already familiar with him. I know he's one of uh, Mike Landry's favorite saints to talk about, but today I get to talk about him. So for those of you that are not familiar with him, he was a Franciscan friar who was interned at Auschwitz in the Second World War. He was born in 1864 in Poland. When he was seven years old, this is from um, one of his articles that he wrote at one point in time, he prayed to Mary and he said, he says, um, that night I asked the mother of God what was to become of me. Then she came to me holding two crowns, one white, the other red. She asked me if I was willing to accept either of these crowns. The white one meant that I should persevere in purity and the red one that I should become a martyr. I said that I would accept them both. And from that point forward, he lived his whole life for Christ. Just a, like a brief kind of list of his accomplishments. He published newsletters. He founded monasteries and seminaries, one in Japan. Um, he staunchly opposed communism. He completed missions in Asia during times of great turmoil when it was not easy to be a Catholic. He organized a hospital at the start of World War II, was one of only a few friars who remained in Poland after it was captured by Nazi Germany. Um, he outright refused to sign a document that would protect him from internment if he addressed his German citizenship or his German ancestry. Um, and he wouldn't do it because he knew it was wrong. So, um, throughout the war at his friary, he continued providing shelter for anyone that needed it, including 2000 Jews who he hid from German persecution. Colby received permission to continue publishing his religious works. Um, and the guy <laughs> continued to publish anti-Nazi publications. So in the middle of World War II, here's this guy who's already been arrested once and he's continuing to publish um, articles with anti-Nazi sentiments. It's kind of mind-blowing. Um, on February 17th, 1941, the monastery was shut down by the German authorities um, and Maximilian Kolbe was imprisoned and eventually transferred to Auschwitz where um, he eventually died. I know probably most of us are more familiar with this part of his story. So Colby continued to act as a priest the whole time that he was uh, in prison or in interned um, and was subject to really violent harassment because of this. He was beaten, he was lashed. Um, and then finally at the end of July, 1941, after um, there was an attempted prison escape, um, the camp commander ordered 10 people um, to be put into an underground bu bunker and starved to death. One man cried out, my wife, my children, um, and Colby was moved to take his place. So Colby volunteered, Maximilian Colby volunteered himself to take the place of this man with his children. Um, he continued doing what Maximilian Colby will do while he was interred. He continued to lead all the prisoners in prayer. Um, whenever the guards checked on him, he was calm, he was collected, and he was on his knees or standing and praying. Um, after they had been starved and deprived of water for two weeks, only Maximilian remained alive. At this point in time, the guards kind of thought it was just taking too long. So they went in and they gave him a lethal injection of carbolic acid. Um, 
apparently Colby or Maximilian Colby just raised his arm and accepted it for what it was. He died on August 14th, 1941. So I share with you this story about Maximilian Colby because this is a man who lived quite literally his whole life for Jesus. From that moment where he prayed to Mama Mary and accepted those two crowns, he was always trying to do what God wanted of him. And that's kind of the kicker of everything is it has to be habit. It must be habit. Sorry. St. Maximilian <laughs> did not just give up and volunteer himself out of nowhere one day. He was living his whole life for others as Christ wanted him to do so that when the day came, he was able to offer himself in place of the other man. It's so, like the real question, why did he do it? Or maybe a better question, how could he do it? Can you imagine giving your life for the life of another, for a stranger? Um, if I had to hazard a guess, I would say the answer is no. And that's pretty darn normal. I feel the same way. The only person that I can even fathom the idea of giving my own life for would be my child. So what was so special about Maximilian Colby? Well, nothing and everything. Um, he had fortitude, but we can have it too. So Maximilian Colby's case was extreme. We will more than likely not be called to give our lives for another, but we are certainly called to stand up for what we believe in. <clears throat> so fortitude is that firmness of spirit. As a virtue, um, it's a steadiness of will in doing what's good in spite of the difficulties that we face. Sometimes we call it courage, but at its core, it really goes deeper than that. When we talk about courage, we think of these big strong men or knights saving princesses, firefighters, and other first responders. And they are most definitely and certainly some of the most courageous people that I know. But when we talk about fortitude, it goes deeper than that. So someone who has fortitude might be one of those big, strong, buff people that we know, but it may also be that sweet little Nana sitting in the front pew at church, or even somebody who's naturally shy or fearful. Um, someone who has fortitude is someone who keeps going through all the muck of trials and tribulations. Someone who's doing what God has asked of them despite it being difficult because God is asking them to do it. Um, it's being able to withstand obstacles, both little and large, and allowing us to share the gospel day in and day out. It's someone who takes time to listen to God um, and to, to find out what God is asking of him or her and to do it, not because they're unafraid, but despite their fear. So fear is such a natural human emotion um, and human feeling that everybody has. Everybody is scared of something, even the most burly, strong, tough guy that you can think of. He's scared of something. My husband, scared of spiders. And yet in every other way, he's one of the strongest people I know. Um, fear is so normal and it's not one that we can, it's not a feeling that we can easily overcome. But having fortitude is continuing on the right path despite our fear um, or its difficulty. Uh, not even necessarily overcoming that fear, but continuing on with it by your side. So the Catechism of the Catholic Church says that fortitude is the moral virtue that ensures firmness in difficulties and constancy in the pursuit of good. It strengthens the resolve to resist temptations and to overcome obstacles in the moral life. The virtue of fortitude enables one to conquer fear, even the fear of death, and to face trials and persecutions. It disposes uh, one even to renounce and sacrifice his life or her life in defense of a just cause. The Lord is my strength and my song in the world you have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. 
So someone who has fortitude is faithful to Christ day in and day out so that when the most difficult days are upon us, we can be strong and continue on as a natural response born out of habit. It cannot be just one grand moment. Just like Maximilian Kolbe, he lived his whole life for the Lord. So when it came time for his sacrifice, he was prepared. He had already been doing what God had been asking him from the moment that he accepted those crowns from Mary. It's easy to be Christian when things are easy. It becomes more difficult when they are not. Um, and that difficulty can look different for everyone. It may be standing up for your faith at school, being vocal about what you believe in, or living through cancer treatment, or even praying daily. Um, it doesn't have to be anything amazing or outlandish. It doesn't have to be grand. It can be quiet and unassuming, um, living your life with a quiet adherence to the Lord's will. Okay, it doesn't have to be a grand gesture. Let's start small. So, continuing on, there's a really great book, one of my favorite books, um, called The Screw Tape Letters by C.S. Lewis. If you haven't read it, I strongly suggest that you do at some point in time. It's a series of let letters, correspondence, um, between like a an uncle demon and a nephew demon. Um, and the one demon, well, they both are tempting humans. And my favorite quote in the book says, courage is not simply one of the virtues, but the form of every virtue at its testing point, which means at the point of highest reality. So basically, uh, <laughs> what it comes down to is it's easy to be good when it's easy to be good or it's easy to be prudent when it's easy to be prudent, or it's easy to be honest when it's easy to be honest. It's easy to say, I'm not gonna eat chocolate cake during Lent when there's no chocolate cake around, but it becomes more difficult when it'll cost you something, when there's that chocolate cake right in front of you, when there's something to lose out on. It's in those moments that we need fortitude. We need to be courageous and we need to stand firm. So it's hard to view myself as someone who has fortitude. I often see my own failings and difficulties before I see my strengths. Something else that I think is quite common with many, if not all humans. Um, but I managed to pick out a time in my life where I think I displayed at least a little bit of fortitude. And I want to share that with you now. So earlier when I was introducing myself, I mentioned my daughter, Ella, um, and quite a bit of our journey with Ella, especially our early journey was rife with opportunities to grow in fortitude. Um, and my husband and I had been married for almost five years before we were lucky enough, um, for me to get pregnant. We had been waiting for such a long time and we were so happy to finally be expecting our baby girl. Everything was good. We didn't know she was going to be a baby girl at, the, at that point in time, but all was well with our worlds. Um, I went to all the ultrasounds, all the doctor's appointments, did everything that was recommended. We were so excited. I, I can't even, it was so excited. Um, I think that any pregnant woman shows a certain degree of fortitude, but a woman who ends up being 10 days overdue can show even more. Maybe not with grace, but certainly with fortitude. Ella's always been my stubborn little girl. Um, and she came into this world just like that. Um, she ended up being an emergency C-section. So I was put out entirely. And for the first hour of her life, I was basically asleep. When I finally got to hold her, I only got to hold her for about 10 very groggy minutes. Um, had I known that it was going to be the last time I would get to hold her for quite some time, I might not have given her up so easily. Uh, one of the amazing nurses took her back to the nursery to kind of clean her up and do some of the standard newborn tests. Um, and she said that she would bring her back shortly, but they didn't. Um, eventually a nurse came and told me that they were keeping her in the nursery for observation because she was a little dusky, a little purple, uh, which is pretty common 
when mama has to be put under completely for a c-section so okay i wait and i wait some more and i wait some more and they just kind of every once in a while someone would pop back in we're just giving her a little bit longer we're gonna get a doctor to have a peek at her and then um i was sitting in my room just kind of waiting and waiting and waiting and my husband got to go see her and my parents got to go see her and my brother got to go see her and my best friend got to go see her and I was stuck in bed because I just had this c-section and I literally couldn't walk yet um, eventually a doctor came in and kind of dropped this huge bombshell on all of us uh, he asked anybody that wasn't family to leave the room uh, but we all stayed because often a best friend is family um, and he told us that Ella was turning purple because her oxygen levels were incredibly low. And he said it was probably because she had an underlying severe heart defect. In that moment, I honestly thought I was going to lose her. My heart sank. I gasped for air. And I felt my best friend squeeze my hand tight. All of a sudden, everything was very clear and very much a blur all at the same time. The doctor kind of left not knowing um, the damage he had just caused. Ella was going to be sent to the Stollery, the local um, emergency hospital for kids basically, as soon as possible to figure out what was going on with her heart. Looking back on that moment, um, I know that the person I was in the past before that day would have flashed out to God in that moment um, angered that he would give me a sick baby after we had waited so long but instead through my grief and my pain and my panic I moved forward don't get me wrong um, I was still panicking still scared and still a little a lot desperate uh, but I did my best um, the best I could to put my trust in God we called some friends one of whom was a priest and got them there as soon as possible the next time I saw Ella she was wheeled into my room I still couldn't stand in a special transport carrier um, that kind of looked like an iron lung and it's called a stork Ella was baptized while in the stork with a tiny syringe full of sterile water. Um, two priests were present, Father Mark Kramer and Father Carlos Nunez, um, a hospital chaplain, her grandparents, parents, her uncle, and her bonus aunt, and obviously my husband. Um, my doctor was also there at the foot of my bed, and I can honestly say I've never been so thankful for an amazing Christian doctor. It's actually kind of interesting. I um, I was initially really scared to have her baptized because I didn't want to admit that um, she may die. But from somewhere within, I was reminded that we baptize our babies so that they have God's grace bestowed upon them. And that grace can help us get through our toughest times um, of which we were certain Ella would be facing. So we later on found out later on that evening um, that Ella had a very serious heart defect called transposition of the greater arteries, which would require almost immediate surgery. At nine days old, my tiny baby girl, for whom we had prayed, um, was handed over into the arms of a nurse um, and taken into an operating room where they stopped her heart and she's put on a machine to pump her blood and they operated on her tiny strawberry sized heart. Let me tell you, <laughs> neonatal heart surgeons are truly some of the most amazing people on the face of the planet. That day they removed Ella's pencil eraser sized arteries from her heart um, and placed them where they should have been and stitched them back on. And they also had to reroute all of her capillaries. Um, those are the tiny veins on the surface of the heart that are on a newborn's heart, roughly the width of a human hair. So tiny, like, can you imagine? The time that Ella was in the operating room, 
was easily the longest eight hours of my life. But she came out the other end successfully. Um, and she's grown stronger and stronger every single day since then. She is, as cliche as it sounds, our miracle. Um, I suppose we all displayed fortitude in those early days. It was so difficult, but we continued to remind ourselves and remind each other to pray. We went to mass at the U of A chapel and we reminded ourselves that God can work through every difficult situation and circumstance. We just need to have the fortitude to follow him. Uh, Mike Landry again told me at one point in time that my little girl had people praying that hadn't prayed in years. She opened up a conversation with God for many people who had stopped talking to him and that can change a person's life. I was not, none of us were <laughs> standing on top of the soap bo soapbox shouting about Jesus, but I was trying to live through a difficult circumstance with God by my side and continuing to do his will. That very first night in the hospital, shortly after we found out what was wrong with Ella and everyone had gone home, my doctor came and sat with me. He prayed with me and reminded me that our children are not our own. We are their caretakers during their time on earth. Um, and we never know how long we'll have them for. Because just like us, they belong to God. And while that statement is kind of a difficult statement to hear, it's something that gave me so, so much comfort and reminded me of why we're all here why Ella was here, why Ella was born. And it gave me strength to carry on no matter what was to come. Um, it's been said by many a Catholic that if we don't have fortitude, we don't have the other virtues. It's truly um, like the linchpin of all other virtue virtues. It's what kind of holds them together. And yet, it's so difficult for all of us. We have a fallen nature and it often shows when it comes to the virtue of fortitude. We're cowards to say no to ourselves um, in the moment so we can say yes to something we truly want in the long run. So like think of, think of Lent. Let's talk about chocolate cake again. Um, how many times have you vowed to do something or give something up yet in the moment Time and time again, we give in. We can't seem to deny ourselves, even though we know there's a great reward in the end. Fortitude is what helps kind of get you through those moments. Um, so how can we grow in this virtue? How can we have more fortitude or stronger fortitude? So Paul wrote a letter to Timothy. He said this. God did not give you the spirit of timidity or cowardice. He gave you the spirit of power and of love and of self-control. He gave you a spirit of courage. Remember that. Remind yourself that God believes in you. God gave you the gifts that you need to face this day and the next. Trust in God that he will be faithful in his promises and therefore do not give in to fear or intimidation. Rest assured, knowing that the cross you bear is fit just for you as for as Jesus' cross was fit for him. And he's there beside you always. Next, lean on like-minded people who build you up. God puts people in our lives that can aid us and help us on the right path. It's not always your family or your very best friend or the people you expect. It might be a close friend or a priest or somebody that you really don't expect. Um, keep your eyes out for these people and allow them to help you. It is so easy to go through life feeling like you need to do everything on your own and you don't. Um, you're not alone. God puts people in our lives that can help us and we need to let them help us. Finally, pray. Always pray. Tell the Lord that you cannot do this without him. Pray that you are strong enough for what lies ahead 
and petition for the strength to endure injustice. Finally, guys, I want to wrap up by doing just that and praying together. So let's make the sign of the cross in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, I may never face the persecution that has taken the lives of many of your followers, but I pray for their strength and resolve. When face to face with my own adversaries, be they external or internal, fortify me with courage and devotion. In your holy name, I pray. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks for listening, guys. Please know that I am praying for you. We'll see you. Have a good day.